Bellbirds by Henry Kendall, read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug, Perth, Western Australia. Bellbirds, by channels of coolness the echoes are calling, and down the dim gorges I hear the creek falling. It lives in the mountain where moss and the sedges touch with their beauty the bank and the ledges. Through breaks of the cedar and sycamore bowers struggles the light that is love to the flowers. And softer than slumber, and sweeter than singing, the notes of the bellbirds are running and ringing. The silver-voiced bellbirds, the darlings of daytime, they sing in September their songs of the maytime. When shadows wax strong, and the thunderbolts hurtle, they hide with their fear in the leaves of the myrtle. When rain and the sunbeams shine mingled together, they start up like fairies that follow fair weather. And straightway the hues of their feathers unfolden are the green and the purple, the blue and the golden. October, the maiden of bright yellow tresses, loiters for love in these cool wildernesses, loiters knee-deep in the grasses to listen, where dripping rocks gleam and the leafy pools glisten. Then is the time when the water moons splendid break with their gold and are scattered or blended over the creeks till the woodlands have warning of songs of the bellbird and wings of the morning. Welcome as waters unkissed by the summers are the voices of bellbirds to the thirsty far-comers. When fiery December sets foot in the forest and the need of the wayfarer presses the sorest, Pent in the ridges for ever and ever the bellbirds direct him to spring and to river, with ring and with ripple, like runnels whose torrents are toned by the pebbles and the leaves in the currents. Often I sit, looking back to a childhood, mixed with the sights and the sounds of the wild wood, longing for power and the sweetness to fashion, lyrics with beats like the heartbeats of passion. Songs interwoven of lights and of laughters Borrowed from bellbirds in far forest rafters. So I might keep in the city and alleys The beauty and strength of the deep mountain valleys, Charming to slumber the pain of my losses With glimpses of creeks and a vision of mosses. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Dalliance of the Eagles by Walt Whitman Read for LibriVox.org by Joshua Commander Skirting the river road, my forenoon walk, my rest, Skyward in air a sudden muffled sound, The dalliance of the eagles, The rushing amorous contact high in space together, The clinching interlocking claws, A living, fierce, gyrating will, Four beating wings, two beaks, A swirling mass, tight grappling, in tumbling, turning, clustering loops, straight downward falling, till o'er the river poised, the twain yet one, a moment's lull, a motionless still balance in the air, then parting, talons loosing, upward again on slow firm pinions slanting, their separate diverse flight, she hers, he his, pursuing. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. December by Helen Hunt Jackson. Read for LibriVox.org by Tricia G. The lakes of ice gleam bluer than the lakes of water neath the summer sunshine gleamed, far fairer than when placidly it streamed, the brook its frozen architecture makes, and under bridges white its swift way takes. Snow comes and goes as messenger who dreamed might linger on the road or one who deemed his message hostile gently for their sakes who listened might reveal it by degrees we gird against the cold of winter wind our loins now with mighty bands of sleep in longest darkest nights take rest and ease and every shortening day as shadows creep o'er the brief noontide fresh surprises find end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Highwayman by Alfred Noyes Read for LibriVox.org by Prachi Pense, Wilmington, Delaware The wind was a torrent of darkness Upon the gusty trees 
The moon was a ghostly galleon, tossed upon cloudy seas. The road was a ribbon of moonlight, looping the purple moor, and the highwayman came riding, riding, riding. The highwayman came riding, up to the old inn door. He'd a French cocked hat on his forehead, and a bunch of lace at his chin. He'd a coat of the claret velvet, and breeches of fine doe skin. They fitted with never a wrinkle, his boots were up to his thigh, and he rode with a jeweled twinkle, his rapier hilt a twinkle, his pistol butts a twinkle, under the jeweled sky. Over the cobbles he clattered and clashed in the dark inn yard. He tapped with his whip on the shutters, but all was locked and barred. He whistled a tune to the window, and who should be waiting there? But the landlord's black-eyed daughter, Bess, the landlord's daughter, plaiting a dark red love knot into her long black hair. Dark in the dark old inn yard, a stable wicket creaked, where Tim the ostler listened. His face was white and peaked. His eyes were hollows of madness, his hair like moldy hay. But he loved the landlord's daughter, the landlord's black-eyed daughter. Dumb as a dog, he listened, and he heard the robber say, One kiss, my bonny sweetheart, I'm after a prize tonight, but I shall be back with the yellow gold before the morning light. Yet if they press me sharply and harry me through the day, then look for me by moonlight, watch for me by moonlight, I'll come to thee by moonlight, though hell should bar the way. He stood upright in the stirrups, he scarce could reach her hand, but she loosened her hair in the casement, his face burnt like a brand, as the sweet black waves of perfume came tumbling o'er his breast, then he kissed its waves in the moonlight, O oh, sweet black waves in the moonlight, and he tugged at his reins in the moonlight, and galloped away to the west. He did not come in the dawning, he did not come at noon, and out of the tawny sunset, before the rise of the moon, when the road was a gypsy's ribbon over the purple moor, the red-coat troops came marching, marching, marching. King George's men came marching up to the old inn door. They said no word to the landlord, they drank his ale instead, but they gagged his daughter and bound her to the foot of her narrow bed. Two of them knelt at her casement with muskets by their side. There was death at every window, and hell at one dark window, for Bess could see through her casement the road that he would ride. They had bound her up at attention with many a sniggering jest. They had tied a rifle beside her, with the barrel beneath her breast. Now keep good watch, and they kissed her. She heard the dead man say, Look for me by moonlight, watch for me by moonlight, I'll come to thee by moonlight, though hell should bar the way. She twisted her hands behind her, but all the knots held good. She writhed her hands till her fingers were wet with sweat or blood. They stretched and strained in the darkness, and the hours crawled by like years, till on the stroke of midnight, cold on the stroke of midnight, the tip of one finger touched it, the trigger at least was hers. The tip of one finger touched it, she strove no more for the rest, up she stood at attention, with the barrel beneath her breast. She would not risk their hearing. She would not strive again, for the road lay bare in the moonlight, blank and bare in the moonlight, and the blood in her veins in the moonlight throbbed to her love's refrain. Clot, 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 had they heard it? The horse hooves ringing clear. Clot, 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 in the distance. Were they deaf that they did not hear? Down the ribbon of moonlight, over the brow of the hill, the highwayman came riding, riding, riding. 
The redcoats looked to their priming. She stood up straight and still. Clot, clot in the frosty silence. Clot, clot in the echoing night. Nearer he came and nearer. Her face was like a light. Her eyes grew wide for a moment. She drew one last deep breath. Then her finger moved in the moonlight. Her musket shattered in the moonlight, shattered her breast in the moonlight, and warned him with her death. He turned, he spurred to the west. He did not know who stood, bowed with her head o'er the casement, drenched in her own red blood. Not till the dawn did he hear it, and his face grew gray to hear how best the landlord's daughter, the landlord's black-eyed daughter, had watched for her love in the moonlight, and died in the darkness there. Back he spurred like a madman, shrieking a curse to the sky, with the white road smoking behind him, and his rapier brandished high. Blood red were his spurs in the golden noon, wine red was his velvet coat, when they shot him down in the highway, down like a dog in the highway, and he lay in his blood in the highway, with the bunch of lace at his throat. And still on a winter's night, they say, when the wind is in the trees, when the moon is a ghostly galleon, tossed upon cloudy seas, when the road is a gypsy's ribbon, looping the purple moor, the highwayman comes riding, 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 the highwayman comes riding, up to the old inn door. Over the cobbles he clatters and clangs in the dark inn yard. He taps with his whip on the shutters, but all is locked and barred. He whistles a tune to the window, and who should be waiting there? But the landlord's black-eyed daughter, Bess the landlord's daughter, plaiting a dark red love knot into her long black hair. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Imitation by Edgar Allan Poe. This is a LibriVox recording. Recording by Grace Yang. A dark, unfathomed tide of interminable pride, a mystery and a dream, should my early life seem. I say that dream was fraught with a wild and waking thought of beings that have been which my spirit hath not seen had i let them pass me by with a dreaming eye let none of earth inherit that vision on my spirit those thoughts i would control as a spell upon his soul for that bright hope at last and that light time hath passed, and my worldly rest hath gone, with a sigh as it passed on. I care not though it perish, with a thought I then did cherish. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. In a Restaurant by Wilfred Gibson Read for LibriVox.org by Tricia G. He wears a red rose in his buttonhole, a city clerk on Sunday dining out, and as the music surges over the din, the heady quavering of the violin sings through his blood and puts old cares to rout, and tingles quickening through his shrunken soul, till he forgets the ledgers and the prim, black, crabbed figures and the qualmy smell of ink and musty leather and lead glaze, as, in eternities of summer days, he dives through shivering waves or rides the swell on rose-red seas of melody a-swim. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Love is a Terrible Thing by Grace Fallow Norton Read for LibriVox.org by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio, December 2010. I went out to the farthest meadow. I lay down in the deepest shadow. 
and i said unto the earth hold me and unto the night o oh, enfold me and unto the wind petulantly i cried you know not for you are free and i begged the little leaves to lean low and together for a safe screen then to the stars i told my tale that is my home light there in the vale and oh i know that i shall return but let me lie first mid the unfeeling fern for there is a flame that has blown too near and there is a name that has grown too dear and there is a fear and to the still hills and cool earth and far sky i made moan the heart in my bosom is not my own oh would i were free as the wind on wing love is a terrible thing end of poem this recording is in the public domain Merry Autumn by Paul Lawrence Dunbar Read for LibriVox.org by Ernst Patinama It's all a farce, these tales they tell About the breezes sighing And moans astir o'er field and dell Because the year is dying. Such principles are most absurd. I care not who first taught em. There's nothing known to beast or bird To make a solemn autumn. In solemn times, when grief holds sway, with countenance distressing, you'll note the more of black and grey will then be used in dressing. Now purple tints are all around, the sky is blue and mellow, and e'en the grasses turn the ground from modest green to yellow. The seed burrs all with laughter crack on featherweed and jimson, and leaves that should be dressed in black are all decked out in crimson. A butterfly goes winging by, a singing bird comes after, and nature o'er from earth to sky is bubbling o'er with laughter. The ripples wimple on the rills like sparkling little lasses. The sunlight runs along the hills and laughs among the grasses. The earth is just so full of fun it really can't contain it, and streams of mirth so freely run, the heavens seem to rain it. Don't talk to me of solemn days in autumn's time of splendor, because the sun shows fewer rains and these grow slant and slender. Why, it's the climax of the year, the highest time of living, till naturally its bursting cheer just melts into thanksgiving. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Mystic by Kale Young Rice Read for LibriVox.org by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio December 2010 There is a quest that calls me in nights when I am lone, the need to ride where the ways divide the known from the unknown. I mount what thought is near me, and soon I reach the place, the tenuous rim where the scene grows dim, and the sightless hides its face. I have ridden the wind, I have ridden the sea, I have ridden the moon and stars, I have set my feet in the stirrup-seat of a comet coursing Mars, and everywhere through the earth and air my thought speeds lightning shod, it comes to a place where checking pace, it cries, Beyond lies God. It calls me out of the darkness, it calls me out of sleep, Ride, ride, for you must, to the end of dust, it bids, and on I sweep to the wide outposts of being, where there is gulf alone, and through a vast that was never past, I listen for life's tone. 
I have ridden the wind, I have ridden the night, I have ridden the ghosts that flee from the vaults of death like a chilling breath over eternity. And everywhere is the world laid bare, ether and star and clod, until I wind to its brink and find but the cry, Beyond lies God. It calls me, and ever calls me, and vainly I reply, Fools only ride where the ways divide What is from the whence and why. I'm lifted into the saddle of thoughts too strong to tame, And down the deeps and over the steeps I find ever the same. I have ridden the wind, I have ridden the stars, I have ridden the force that flies with far intent through the firmament, And each to each allies. And everywhere that a thought may dare to gallop, mine has trod, only to stand at last on the strand, where just beyond lies God. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Relapse by Henry Vaughan read for LibriVox.org. My God, how gracious art thou! I have slipped almost to hell, and on the verge of that dark, dreadful pit did hear them yell. But oh, thy love, thy rich, almighty love, that saved my soul, and checked their fury when I saw them move, and heard them howl. O oh, my soul, comfort, take no more of these ways, this hideous path and I will mend my own without delays. Seize thou thy wrath, I have deserved a thick Egyptian damp, dark as my deeds, should mist within me, and put out that lamp. Thy spirit feeds, a darting conscience full of stabs and fears, no shade but you, sullen and sad eclipses, cloudy spheres, these are my due, but he that with his blood, a price too dear, my scores did pay, bid me, by virtue from him, challenge here, the brightest day, sweet downy thoughts, soft lily shades, calm streams, joys full and true, fresh spicy mornings, and eternal beams, these are his due. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Romance by Edgar Allan Poe. This is a LibriVox recording. Recorded by Grace Yang. Romance who loves to nod and sing with drowsy head and folded wing among the green leaves as they shake far down within some shadowy lake. To me, a painted paroquet hath been a most familiar bird taught me my alphabet to say, to lisp my very earliest word. While in the wild wood I did lie, a child with a most knowing eye. Of late eternal condor years, so shake the very heaven on high, with tumult as they thunder by. I have no time for idle cares, through gazing on the unquiet sky. And when an hour with calmer wings Its down upon my spirit flings, That little time with lyre and rhyme To while away forbidden things, My heart would feel to be a crime Unless it trembled with the strings. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Brown Delay by Richard Jago Read for LibriVox.org by Olivia Clayton Cypress, Texas, December 28, 2010 Sisters of the tuneful train, attend your parents' jocund strain. Tis fancy calls you, follow me, to celebrate the jubilee. On Avon's banks, where Shakespeare's bust points out and guards his sleeping dust, 
The sons of scenic mirth agree to celebrate the jubilee. Hang around the sculptured tomb, the broidered vest, the nodding plume, and the mask of comic glee to celebrate the jubilee. From Burnham Wood and Bosworth Field, bring the standard, bring the shield, with drums and martial symphony to celebrate the jubilee. In mournful numbers now relate poor Desdemona's hapless fate, with frantic deeds of jealousy to celebrate the jubilee. Nor be the Windsor's wives forgot with their harmless merry plot, the whitening mead, the haunting tree to celebrate the jubilee. Now in jocund strains recite the humors of the braggard knight, fat knight and ancient pistol he to celebrate the jubilee. But see in crowds the gay, the fair, to the splendid scene repair, a scene as line as fine can be to celebrate the jubilee. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Rules and Regulations by Lewis Carroll, read by Aparna Vishwanatham. This is a LibriVox recording. Rules and Regulations A short direction to avoid dejection by variations in occupations and prolongation of relaxation and combinations of recreations and disputation on the state of the nation in adaptation to your station by invitations to friends and relations, by evitation of amputation, by permutation in conversation, and deep reflection, you will avoid dejection. Learn well your grammar, and never stammer. Write well and neatly, and sing most sweetly. Be enterprising, love early rising. Go walk of six miles, have ready quick smiles, with lightsome laughter, soft flowing after. Drink tea, not coffee. Never eat toffee. Eat bread with butter. Once more, don't stutter. Don't waste your money. Abstain from honey. Shut doors behind you. Don't slam them, mind you. Drink beer, not water. Don't enter the water till to swim you are able. Sit close to the table. Take care of a candle. Shut a door by the handle. Don't push with your shoulder until you are older. Lose not a button, refuse cold mutton. Starve your canaries, believe in fairies. If you're able, don't have a stable with any mangers. Be rude to strangers. Moral, behave. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet 11 by Richard Barnfield, read for LibriVox.org by Martin Geeson in Hazelmere, Surrey. Sighing and sadly sitting by me love, he asked the cause of me heart sorrowing, conjuring me by heaven's eternal king to tell the cause which me so much did move. Compelled, cause I. To thee will I confess, love is the cause, and only love it is that doth deprive me of me heavenly bliss. Love is the pain that doth me hard oppress. And what is she, quoth he, who thou dost love? Look in this glass, quoth I, there shalt thou see the perfect form of me felicity. When thinking that it would strange magic prove, he opened it, and taking off the cover, he straight perceived himself to be me lover. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To One in Bedlam by Ernest Dowson Read for LibriVox.org by Martin Geeson in Hazelmere, Surrey. With delicate mad hands behind his sordid bars, surely he hath his posies which they tear and twine. 
those scentless wisps of straw that miserably line his straight caged universe whereat the dull world stares pedant and pitiful oh how his rapt gaze wars with their stupidity know they what dreams divine lift his long laughing reveries like enchanted wine and make his melancholy germane to the stars o oh, lamentable brother if those pity thee am i not fain of all thy lone eyes promise me half a fool's kingdom far from men who sow and reap all their days vanity better than mortal flowers thy moon-kissed roses seem better than love or sleep the star-crowned solitude of thine oblivious hours end of poem this recording is in the public domain the tiger by william blake read for LibriVox.org by joshua commander tiger tiger burning bright in the forests of the night what immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry in what distant deeps or skies burnt the fire of thine eyes on what wings dare he aspire what the hand dare seize the fire and what shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart and when thy heart began to beat what dread hand and what dread feet what the hammer what the chain in what furnace was thy brain what the anvil what dread grasp dare its deadly terrors clasp when the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their tears did he smile his work to see did he who made the lamb make thee tiger tiger burning bright in the forests of the night what immortal hand or eye dare frame thy fearful symmetry end of poem this recording is in the public domain Where the Dead Men Lie by Barcroft Boak Read for LibriVox.org by Algy Pug Out on the wastes of the never-never That's where the dead men lie There where the heat waves dance for ever That's where the dead men lie That's where the earth's loved sons Are keeping endless tryst Not the west wind sweeping Fevery's pinions can wake their sleeping Out where the dead men lie where brown summer and death have mated, That's where the dead men lie. Loving with fiery lust unsated, That's where the dead men lie. Out where the grinning skulls bleach whitely, Under the salt bush sparkling brightly, Out where the wild dogs chorus nightly, That's where the dead men lie. Deep in the yellow flowing river, That's where the dead men lie. Under the banks where the shadows quiver, That's where the dead men lie. Where the platypus twists and doubles, Leaving a train of tiny bubbles, Rid at last of their earthly troubles, That's where the dead men lie. East and backward pale faces turning, That's how the dead men lie. Gaunt arms stretched with a voiceless yearning, That's how the dead men lie. Oft in the fragrant bush of nooning, Hearing again their mother's crooning, Wrapped for aye in a dreamful swooning, That's how the dead men lie. Only the hand of night can free them, That's when the dead men fly. Only the frightened cattle see them, See the dead men go by. Cloven hoofs beating out one measure, Bidding the stockmen know no leisure, That's when the dead men take their pleasure, that's when the dead men fly. Ask, too, the never-sleeping drover, He sees the dead pass by, Hearing them call to their friends, The plover, hearing the dead men cry, Seeing their faces stealing, stealing, Hearing their laughter, peeling, peeling, Watching their grey forms wheeling, wheeling, Round where the cattle lie. Strangled by thirst and fierce privation, that's how the dead men die. 
Out on Money Grub's farthest station, that's how the dead men die. Hard faced greybeards, youngsters callow, some mounds cared for, some left fallow, some deep down, yet others shallow, some having but the sky. Money Grub, as he sips his claret, looks with complacent eye down at his watch chain, eighteen carat, there in his club hard by. Wrecks not that every link is stamped with names of the men whose limbs are cramped with too long lying in grave mould, cramped with death where the dead men lie. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.